3rd of December 2021. Today is the National Day of People with Disabilities. Everyone desires touch. Sex, 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 sex workers to be funded from news.com.au. I'm Andrew Buckalo, and I've got news for you. Well, fun fact for you, today is International Day of People with Disability. And I've got another fun fact for you. Did you know that people with disabilities in Australia can apply to the NDIS for funding to hire sex workers for themselves? Now, I'll be honest, I wasn't aware of this until recently, and the first time I heard it, I was like, oh, that's a bit odd. But when you think about it, it's not. It makes perfect sense. I mean, people with disabilities should 100% have the right to apply for funding to spend on services that allow them to live a fulfilling life, and sex is a big part of that. Now, even though I'm on board, the federal government is not. They're actually trying to change the law to prevent people with disabilities from using NDIS funds for sex workers. Today, we're going to chat to a senator who's doing all he can to block the government's changes. And we'll also meet Olive, a sex worker from Melbourne, who'll reveal what it's like working with clients who have disabilities. Sex and disability is such a taboo topic, but everyone is interested in it. It's the same with sex work. Everyone is interested in it, but nobody's asking questions about it. Jordan Steele-John is a Green Senator from WA. He is a fierce disability rights advocate. He's the youngest senator in Australia and the first senator to use a wheelchair. Jordan, thanks for coming on. I've got news for you. Great to be with you, Andrew. Now, there might be some people listening who aren't really aware what the NDIS, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, is. Can you just explain it and how it works? Absolutely. Um, So, kind of very much simplified, the NDIS is a a program that was created 10 years ago to provide disabled people and our families with the supports and services uh, that we need to live a good life, just like everybody else. It's, I think, a reflection of our Australian community's commitment to the idea that people should be able to uh, live a good life with the basic supports and uh, services that they need to uh, live that life in a way that is determined by and for them. So it provides support workers for disabled people, it provides services for disabled people, um, it provides uh, assistive technologies like the wheelchair I'm sitting in right now, all designed to facilitate disabled people and their families to achieve our goals as defined in our NDIS plans. Well, speaking of funding, one thing that I wasn't aware of until recently is that the NDIS can provide funds to people with disabilities to access sex services or sex workers. Is that right? Yes. So the NDIS kind of replaced a a number of state-based schemes that existed previously to it. Um, And those state-based schemes in different uh, states and territories uh, funded sex-based supports and sex-based services in certain circumstances. Uh, So the NDIS carried that on. And that's a capacity that has been confirmed by various federal court processes. And basically, what exists is the ability of somebody to make a case that uh, a certain support is reasonable and necessary given their context. And if you make that case effectively, um, it can be funded. And it mirrors many of the other processes that we have in publicly funded systems to fund sex-based supports too, under the healthcare system, for instance. Why do you think it is so important for people with disabilities to be able to use NDIS funds for sexual services? I think it's important to acknowledge, Andrew, that the disabled people uh, have a right to sexual expression mm. um, and that the NDIS exists to provide people with the supports and services that they need, as we said earlier, to meet their goals uh, and to live uh, a good life in the same way that, that everybody else does. And uh, for some people, uh, a sex-based support, whether that be a physical piece of assistive tech or a sex-based service, is a reasonable and necessary support for them. Let me tell you a bit about what this actually looks like, though, in in practice, because I think sometimes when we talk about it, you know, people's minds can go off in all sorts of directions. Sure. I like to go back to an example that has been made public in the ACT, um, where uh, two barristers that are uh, married um, and have been married for a long time, who are also quadriplegic, engage the use, uh, like the services of a sex worker to act as a basically a sex-based support worker um, so that they can engage in physical intimacy with each other. Um, So those are some of the kind of supports that people access. So I should clarify, I'm not breaking anybody's confidence there. They've Mm. spoken about their 
experience uh, publicly. So not kind of outing them in this moment on <laughs> uh, on a podcast. So it can look complex. Uh, it can look simple. Uh, reflecting the the reality that disabled people are human beings and are just like every other human being that exists. When it comes to our, our shared right for sexual expression and, and what that looks like in reality, that is as complex, non-complex, and ultimately individualised as the person themselves. Now, there's a federal minister named Stuart Robert from the Liberal Party. He said earlier yes, this year... Sadly, Stuart Robert is a thing that exists. <laughs> he said earlier this year that he wants to change the law so that people with disabilities can't use NDIS funds for sex services. Let's have a listen to what he had to say on Sky News. When the law was built, what was defined as reasonable and necessary supports for what are now 420,000 fabulous Australians with disability that are receiving just life-changing supports. But because reasonable and necessary necessary supports weren't defined, Uh, the federal court has now ruled that the provision of sexual services, prostitutes if you like, uh, would not be precluded from that and a case was brought forward to it. Uh, Now we don't believe that that's in the spirit of what the Australian people are funding the NDIS through their taxes. Jordan, how do you feel about his comments? Well I think the the comments uh, from from the Liberals here are really unfair, quite frankly, and they're a double standard um, that the Australian community shouldn't ex- be expected to accept. We spend, through the health budget, or have spent, about $50 million over the last 20 years subsidising Viagra via the PPS. Um, now, that is a sex-based support that disabled people and non-disabled people uh, alike utilise. Um, That's been something that's been done for decades with very little controversy, and it is right that that is available under the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme. The question for uh, anybody, you know, Stuart Robert or anybody else, would be, you know, why why is Viagra okay for everybody, uh, but sex-based support for disabled people um, is not? Ultimately, what we need is an NDIS that supports disabled people uh, to live our lives just like everybody else and to make the case for those reasonable and necessary supports that we need to achieve our goals within our uh, plans uh, as part of our you know, broader human journey as disabled people. Has he made any moves to try and change the law so far? Uh, yes. Um, the, the government bill that they've got uh, right now before the parliament would tighten criteria in a way that we believe will be used to overrule the the federal court ruling that has said that these kind of supports can be considered reasonable and necessary. So there is a consistent effort on behalf of of the Liberal Party to uh, take away from the people that have these supports the supports that are currently in their plan. Jordan, uh, finally, today is International Day of People with Disability. What's one thing that non-disabled people can do to be better allies for those with disabilities? That's an excellent question, Andrew. I think the key to good allyship is uh, beginning with sitting down uh, with a disabled person and listening to the challenges that we face, the aspirations that we have, the ways in which we want to break down the barriers, uh, build an inclusive uh, society, and then figuring out how you can work with us to co-design the steps, the processes needed, and the kind of link arms with us in achieving that goal. Olive Pearl is a 30-year-old sex worker from Melbourne who has several clients with disabilities, and she regularly does Q&A videos on TikTok with some of her clients in a bid to help remove the stigma around people with disabilities having sex. Olive, thanks for coming on I've Got News For You. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> so how long have you been a sex worker? Um, on and off since I was 18, but I have been working full time now for the past two and a half years, roughly. Okay, so what made you want to get into the industry? Um, well, when I first started, I was just young and I wanted some extra cash. <laughs> <laughs> that was honestly the reason. Um, and then I just started again because I've, I've just wanted to do something else. Mm. I was t- doing teaching for a little while and um, I have to say that unfortunately you're not 
fairly compensated for your time. Mm. But with sex work, I feel I definitely am. <laughs> well, just under a year ago, you started working with a man in Melbourne named Gavin. Now he has cerebral mm-hmm. palsy. How did you yeah. two get in touch originally? Um, he actually contacted me. Um, so I have some profiles online where people can contact me and he just sent me a text message. Okay, and so did you guys like have a meeting initially and kind of discuss what he want from you? Um, he was uh, he's really good in communicating what he was looking for. So he uh, straight away said, "Look, I'm in a wheelchair. Would you see someone who is in a wheelchair?" And I said, "Yes, no worries." So I um, went to see him at his place, and yeah. How often do you see him now? It really depends on his schedule, but um, it tends to be weekly. So Gavin's non-verbal, isn't he? So how do mm. you two communicate? Mm. Um, well, at the start, he had to just listen to me ramble on about <laughs> it. <laughs> um, but he can communicate, obviously, um, via text. So if there was anything unclear, like we would just um, text each other. But he can also communicate with... So he's using just his head to um, write the letters of the alphabet and capital letters into the air. So it obviously takes a little bit of time, first of all, to um, learn it, like to learn how to understand it. And then for him, it takes some time also because imagine you have to spend every word, every letter, you have to write it into the air with your head as a movement. Yeah. But yeah, that's just how we communicate. So when you're together, if I can ask, what is it generally mm. that you do? Is it just sex? Some sexy time. <laughs> <laughs> Not just that, but um, obviously, I mean, I'm a sex worker, so that is why people hire me, <laughs> um, I would say 95% of the time. But it's also a conversation. We always have a laugh. Um So, yeah, I would say that's um, included as well in the time. And do you need any special equipment to kind of pull this off? You mentioned that Gavin is in a wheelchair. So do Mm. you guys have anything that kind of helps you out? We we tried a sex swing, which we also reviewed on TikTok. Okay. Um, but it's kind of shit. So <laughs> sorry, can I swear? Yeah. Yes, you can swear. Go for it. <laughs> it's shit. Like we tried it, and it was not the right thing. And actually, he bought another one because we thought, oh, maybe that one is better. One's kind of shit as well. So <laughs> and um, I guess I just toys, anything that you can buy in a sex shop, which is just nothing that is. Um, like especially for someone with a disability, but yeah, just to spice things up, I guess. And I guess you have to try to kind of try unique positions every now and then to make it work better for you. <laughs> um, well, he because he has he can't move and his body, you know, is spasming. Like it can't he he can't really control his like arms and everything so he would just be lying and obviously he in his house for example the bed that he has um you can adjust the part where your back is lying on so you can move it up or down and for you personally how does having sex with a disabled person compare to having sex with someone who isn't disabled Mm. i personally don't see that there's a big difference because at the end of the day it is just another body it Mm. is a person like yeah maybe a communication and that's a little bit different maybe the looks of the body are different but then again like everyone looks different anyways it doesn't matter um disability or not and um (sighs) I would say maybe sometimes, yes, you have to be a bit more creative, but also, again, if you are seeing someone regularly, if it's a client or even a partner, you get creative after a while just to spice things up anyways. Olive and her client Gavin, who has cerebral palsy, regularly post videos on TikTok together where they answer questions about having sex with a person with a disability. So far, their videos have racked up more than a million views. Olive, whose idea was it to start doing these TikTok videos? It was Gavin's idea. Okay. And I, yeah, it was so cool. He asked me, um, do you want to do TikTok together? And I thought about it because I thought... Um, sex and disability is such a kind of 
taboo a topic but everyone is interested in it. it's the same with sex work everyone is interested in it but nobody's <laughs> asking questions about it so and then sex work and disability <laughs> like wow <laughs> what sort of reaction have you had to your videos oh it's so mixed i want to say um and it's amazing it was the majority positive people are like, oh my God, you guys are like great. And, but there has obviously also been some comments that just belong into the garbage. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Can I ask, as a sex worker, when people find out you're a sex worker, what are the most common questions they ask you? Um, oh my God. Um, <laughs> <laughs> probably kind of things like ah oh, are you planning on doing it for a long time or you you must be working towards um a goal like having enough money to study oh, right. or you know like nobody sees it as an actual profession that yeah i will be f-ing people when i'm 80 <laughs> okay <laughs> like, yeah that and then um do you enjoy your work and what's or what's the worst thing that ever happened and do you like your clients just where I'm, I don't judge people for their questions because I would also ask those kind of things, I think. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask then, can I be one of those yeah. people, what's the weirdest thing that you've you've had during a, uh, a, a, a session with a client? <laughs> oh, my God. There's, oh, my God, there's so many things. But the funniest, <laughs> it's called balloon fetish. It was a, at an establishment, so at a brothel, and this guy walks in, wants to book a girl, and um, he's like, ah, oh, I have a balloon fetish. I'm like, that's cool. No idea what it is, but <laughs> open to it, open to anything. And his fetish was literally, he brought in a little bag full of balloons, like party balloons that you blow up in all different colors, Mickey Mouse shape with little snowflakes on it. Okay. and. Yeah, just balloons. And his excitement came from watching, oh, he booked me and another girl, so two girls, I should say that as well. Um, he uh, wanted to watch us blow the balloons up to the point where they would almost burst. And that was, he was sitting at the edge of the bed, right? Yeah, he's sitting there watching two naked girls just like blowing up balloons. And then, when they popped, he'd be like, oh, like that, was, <laughs> that, was like, that was like the thing for him. And he's like, oh, yeah, just have fun with it. Throw them through the air, like pop them with your bottle. So we put them on the ground. He would like pop them sitting sitting on it and rubbing them on our boobs and just throwing them to each other. It was so funny. It was one and a half hours of literally just doing that. And that was it. Far out. You must have been out of breath after that. Oh my god! And the other girl, she said, "Oh, I can't like the the fright that you get from when the balloon is bursting is killing me." <laughs> no judgment for anyone who's listening to this. If you have a fetish, if it doesn't hurt someone, if it doesn't, um, you know, it's a negative influence to someone else. Like, why not? Like, live your best life. A hundred percent. Yeah, Olive. Before I let you go, um, not many people might know this, but disabled people in Australia are allowed to use NDIS funds on sex worker services yeah. if it's deemed reasonable and necessary. But mm. there is a government minister named Stuart Robert who wants to change that. Has suggested the government might try and change it in the future. What would your message to him be? Um, I would be saying to him, "What the hell, Stuart? <laughs> why? <laughs> I mean, why would you take that away? Because." Unfortunately, um, when you have a disability, dating is more difficult. That's mm. just how it is, unfortunately. And if you want to explore your sexuality, just because you're disabled doesn't mean that you aren't sexual. Mm. Like, and you are able to get funds to hire a sex worker, then that's fantastic. And you should not take this away from people because that's just wrong. Alrighty, if you want to check out Olive's TikTok videos, her handle is The Proud Accountant. And don't forget, as Senator Jordan Steele John told us earlier, to celebrate International Day of People with Disability, why not sit down with one of your friends or family members who has a disability and just chat to them about what you can do to help them achieve their goals? Why not, huh? That's all we've got time for today. I'll see you next time.